Good evening, I'm Susan Ormiston and this is The National. Going home in the wake of Harvey. For many, it just brings more heartbreak. Manitoba wildfires force thousands to seek shelter. It's a long wait to leave with few places to go. It became so unbearably hot in there and one boy was very ill. Tales of horror from passengers who were stranded on the tarmac for hours. And he ended up throwing up all over passengers. Plus, Amazon blew up the book biz. Your groceries are next. The Loblaws, the Metros, the Sobeys, they're all going to have to respond. Imagine if everything you once owned was gone. As drier weather starts to move into Texas tonight, that is the reality for hundreds of thousands of people. They survived the storm, but what now? Harvey made landfall for a third time today, just before dawn, west of Cameron, Louisiana. It's slowly making its way northeast now, weakening as it goes. But before Harvey moved on to Louisiana, the storm unleashed record-breaking amounts of rain on the Beaumont Port Arthur area of Texas. And listen to this. As of 8 o'clock this morning, Harvey had dumped nearly 93 trillion liters of water on the two states, a lot of it swirling into houses, apartment complexes, and trailers. More than 30,000 people are still in shelters tonight. Importantly, we have approximately 30,000 beds that are available for sheltering as needed and we continue to work on additional backup plans in the event that more than that is needed. And more may well be needed as the waters recede. People are getting a look at their homes for the first time since the weekend and realizing they won't soon be living there, if at all. Adrian Arsenault was with some of them today. How first glimpses deceive. It was such a pretty morning in Houston today. The wretched water finally draining away. But this is the time it gets ugly again. Police called because someone's seen a body in the water. And I don't know where. Rumor or truth? Not sure. Oh my God, she's underwater. She said she can't breathe. But that people were being swept away was immediately clear when Hurricane Harvey hit. This was the Wood Forest Chase Apartments complex on Sunday. And these are the choked streets around it today. Inside the complex, those coming back for what they can. There's not much, and it is a mess. That they're here at all is incredible. This is a video of us on the roof. We stayed up there for two days. Uh, thanks to our neighbors, they allowed us to come on top of their roof because we had, we had no more options, really. It was like 30 of us on there. Yeah, we can't get in. I'm trying to find a, a maintenance guy so we can get a key to get in. I don't want to break the window. This retired cop doesn't live here, but a friend sent him to find his dogs that have been trapped inside for days. He's brought food, cages, and friends. We are. Close that door. Okay. All of them. We got them all. Yeah. Um, all right, everybody's in custody. <laughs> <laughs> nice moment, but in the scheme of what's happened to Wood Forest, it doesn't much matter. Around the corner, real devastation. Inside one ruined home, more frantic, now aggressive pets. The woman who lived here died in those floodwaters. Her body found this morning lodged in this fence. It took hours for police and morgue officials to arrive. Neighbors horrified and helpless seeing her like that. She's pinned up against the gate. There have been over 12 deaths in this area. Little children, five years old, rushed out of their parents' hands. The woman's name was Keisha, and her friend Courtney says they had evacuated together. We're almost to safety when Keisha decided to come back for her dog. I just hate that she came back because she was saying she was going to walk through. It was like it's snakes and stuff. Courtney knows loss of friends and homes. She's from Louisiana, endured Hurricane Katrina, and was forced to evacuate after Hurricane Rita 12 years ago. And then I evacuated here and restarted here, and then the same thing happened here. It kind of like put everything up, thinking that, okay, if the flood come, I'm going to be able to save this and save that. But when I went in the house, it was 
everything was just floating. So nothing got saved. Anybody got jumping cables? No. She never did get that car started, but everyone's helping. Spending hours trying to help in the name of their lost friend, Keisha, too. Trying to coax those dogs out. Finally, they came. This is a problem people could handle. Everything else, a little too overwhelming. That story again tonight from Adrian Arsenault in Houston. Well, the cost for cleanup and rebuilding will be monumental, and many people in Houston may be stuck with the bills. The Associated Press crunched some numbers and discovered far fewer Houston homeowners have flood insurance today than just five years ago. The estimate, fewer than two out of ten. There could be many reasons for the drop, but experts believe a lack of fear is the main one. The last big flood was 16 years ago, so it wasn't seen as a big risk. Workers at this call center in Sydney, Nova Scotia, have become a calm voice at the other end of the line for thousands of Harvey's victims. The center has a contract with GM's OnStar service, but after Harvey hit, GM asked if it would field calls for the American Red Cross. A lot Cross. of emergency situations is what we were dealing with at first. You know, people crying, upset, um, obviously uh, not having a place to go, not having food, not having water. Um, and people, you know, with small kids. So it was really, really hard to deal with at first. They say now people are calling, mostly wanting to donate or to volunteer. The storm obviously left hundreds of thousands of people without power. So along with cleanup, a daunting challenge is getting people back online. Kim Brunhuber followed along with a power crew. It's like a horror version of the Three Little Pigs brick houses still standing, those made of anything else, metal, wood, just smashed. Welcome to Rockport, where Harvey landed as a Category 4 hurricane. Everyone seems to have a personal message for Harvey, or for each other. We have blankets. Red Cross workers cruise slowly through the wreckage, offering blankets and food, while other workers busy themselves on the ground and overhead, rebuilding Rockport. The first task, clear the debris. Aaron Fig has been working since 6 a.m. He'll stop at 10 p.m. That's a long day. Yeah, 16 hours and then seven days a week. He's among 50 utility workers from one company who came from Kentucky. They started driving here even before the hurricane when they heard where it was going to land. They knew they'd be needed. They didn't know how much. This is about as bad as it gets. They can't even guess how many poles are down. So they'll start with this one. But already a problem. The line is caught in a tree. Across the city, there are crews like this one from all over Texas and neighboring states. Coordinating them, a nightmare. It's like take 2,000 people that you don't know and trying to get them to march in a marching band. Now they're ready to put in the coal, but it's slow going because of the residual flood water. Uh, the ground here is so saturated. When you try to dig a hole, though, it falls in. They've been here for an hour, and this is just one pole. I have to be honest, I was a little nervous driving so close to so many downed power lines. Turns out I needn't have worried. There is no power here in Rockport. There won't be for weeks, and for some, not for months. The truth is, even if they were to fix every one of these poles today, Rockport still wouldn't have power. The substations for this area, they don't even have transmission lines to feed them. Finally, this pole is ready to mount. It's hard work in 37 degree heat a woman comes to drop off water. No big deal, not worth making a fuss, she says. But as she drives by, she insists on saying this. Rockport will be rebuilt and we will come back stronger than ever. One pole down and someone finds a flag. They'll keep it, find a way to mount it on their truck, to fly like so many others in this broken town, defiant. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Rockport, Texas. So much now depends on the storm's path. And once again tonight, CBC meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us. Johanna, Harvey's now a tropical depression, and it's really moving differently than the last few days. Tell us about that. 
Right, Susan, it is finally starting to pick up forward speed tonight, and that is a good thing, especially after sitting offshore of Texas and Louisiana crawling uh, for the past five days. So that forward motion is good news. Even though it's weakened, though, it's a tropical depression because winds are now below 55 kilometers per hour. It still has tropical characteristics tonight, so it is still funneling very intense uh, rounds of rain right along that Texas-Louisiana border, particularly particularly for the Beaumont area, where we're still looking at some pretty incredible rainfall rates through the overnight. Uh, we could be talking another 250 millimeters, but at least Harvey's beginning to move north. We'll see heavy rain in through northern Louisiana and Kentucky over the next uh, 24 hours, Susan. So how big a risk up north? It's moving along there now. Are they bracing for another bad storm? Well, let me start with the fact that Harvey is not expected to significantly impact Canada. Let me take you through that rainfall forecast. And it tracks up through the Mississippi, Ohio Valley, but then fizzles out before it gets to the upper Great Lakes. That being said, still expecting a lot of rain on this storm track. Uh, Harvey is beginning to weaken, but as it tracks northeastward, it will bring significant rain along that Ohio, uh, Mississippi Valley, uh, being downgraded to a post-tropical storm in the next 48 hours. But staying well south of the Great Lakes. This is still a significant story, though, Susan, uh, likely for the next couple of days. We like to keep it south of the Great Lakes. Thanks, Joanna. You're welcome. Part of the huge economic impact will come from shutting down parts of the Gulf Coast oil industry, and that could affect Canada's oil patch, too. Carolyn Dunn looks at that tonight. If you want to know the size and scope of Hurricane Harvey and the devastation that followed, just put a dollar value on it. That's what the governor of Texas did. Katrina funding was well over $100 billion. I want to say it was over $125 billion. Uh, and uh, so if, if we go on a parallel standard, uh, it should be far in excess of that amount. While the world's eyes have been quite rightly on the people left devastated by Harvey's merciless path, a major industry that employs many of them is shut down. The largest refineries are offline. 30% of the Gulf's output will be affected. Even when we open a port, what we've seen in the past, it'll take several days um, before those facility workers can get back to work. When you can fire up those refineries, when pilots can actually safely get to the boats and then continue business as usual. That may be an optimistic timeline since it doesn't account for repairing equipment damaged by the storm or getting workers back to the area. This energy analyst says that can take many weeks. It could be that the worst is still yet to come because we're seeing kind of greater spread of the implications and um, bigger outages over time is what would happen with Katrina. And it took a full three months before refinery runs and production got back to their pre-storm levels. The worst case scenario, according to the director of energy at the University of Calgary School of Public Policy. If it's a lot longer, then we're looking at uh, a short term large shock to the North American energy market in terms of less capacity to produce refined products and also lower demand for crude oil. That would leave Canadian producers looking for refinery capacity for the 400,000 barrels of oil they send to the Gulf each day. As for the short term, well, consumers have already seen a jump in the price of gas and diesel at the pumps. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Coming up. My children witness dead bodies floating across the water in front of our face. Through sheer determination, she kept her family safe from Harvey. That's not what makes her story so incredible. Plus, it's been 20 years since the crash that killed a princess and stunned the world. Residents of Mumbai face torrents of rain every monsoon season, but today they are reeling. Another bout of rain after the worst downpour in years hit the city yesterday. Train and bus traffic have managed to get up and running, but parts of the city really remain inundated. Check out that gush. A moment's worth of rain fell in just one day. At least 14 people have died in the flooding, including two toddlers. It is the latest in a deadly flooding season across South Asia, across Nepal, Bangladesh and India. Flooding and landslides have killed at least 950 people and affected tens of millions. 
In northern Manitoba, a tent scene. Thousands of people are out of their homes and on the move. Wildfires have forced them to flee, but getting them out has been a challenge. Evacuation orders are in place for three First Nation communities within 20 kilometers of each other in the Island Lake region. That's roughly 570 kilometers northeast of Winnipeg. The CBC's Cameron McIntosh is in St. Teresa Point. The smoke cleared a little bit here today at St. Teresa Point, and that's a good thing. It's allowing hundreds who might have otherwise been stranded to get out. This was the scene at the airport here today with hundreds of people lining up, waiting for flights to carry them out of here. And those planes did ultimately make it into the community. Now, many of those people waiting included children and elderly who waited through the night in a school gym because the smoke was so bad it socked in the community. Most are from the neighboring community of Wasagamac, where late yesterday afternoon the flames came up suddenly. 2,000 people were told to get out immediately. All were taken by boat across the lake to this community. When it say it was a frantic and scary evacuation. There was a big fire. Smoke, lots of smoke. Dark, dark smoke. Did you see it yourself? Yeah. So, was it scary? Very scary. And everybody got evacuated. All the, the ladies and the kids got so, evacuated. Uh, any idea how long you're going to be gone or what's happening with your home right now? No, <laughs> I'm just waiting to find out. Another 850 elderly and vulnerable people are also being taken out of this community and another one across the lake. Logistics are complicated as there aren't many places for people to go. There's no one city in Manitoba that has enough hotel rooms for us for the evacuees. That's why we're using multiple sites. As for the fire itself, it's now within one kilometer of Wasagamac and it's growing, now reaching a size of more than 77,000 hectares. It's considered out of control and the simple change in the wind could make the situation a lot worse. The next community in line to be evacuated is this one, St. Teresa Point. If that happens, the numbers will grow to more than 7,000 evacuees. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, St. Teresa Point. And tonight we are learning the military is getting involved in that rescue effort. A spokesperson for the Department of National Defense says it will be sending in military planes to pick up evacuees. There's no word yet on when those aircraft will arrive. In Saskatchewan, too, wildfires are forcing people from their homes. The heavy smoke and high levels of air pollution plus road closures prompted an evacuation order in effect for the village of Pelican Narrows. More than 1,500 people have left, many of them now on their way to Prince Albert or to Saskatoon. And in southern Ontario, two days of record-breaking rain in and around the city of Windsor left people cleaning up a soggy and sometimes dangerous mess. As of this afternoon, the city said it had received more than 2,600 reports of flooded basements. Well, they say they felt like cargo rather than human beings, that Air Transat was more concerned with the state of its planes than the health of its passengers. In a rare round of hearings by the Canadian Transportation Agency today, people who were trapped on board two planes diverted to an Ottawa tarmac earlier this summer told of the agonizing hours they spent trapped. Here's K Katie Simpson. No water. Why are you going to, to die here? Yeah. A dark picture is emerging about what happened on board two Air Transat planes stuck for hours in weather delays at the Ottawa airport. In the first day of testimony at the Canadian Transportation Agency's inquiry into the matter, passengers spared no details. It became so unbearably hot in there and one boy was very ill and he was walking down, running down the aisle to get to the bathroom and he ended up throwing up all over passengers. We did not have air conditioning. We had hot air blowing in the plane. The stench in that plane was unbelievable. The CTA is investigating what happened on the evening of July 31st, when two Air Transat flights from Europe were diverted to the capital because of bad weather in Montreal. Passengers on both flights were kept on board for four to six hours. They say there was little food and water and no clear answers about why they simply couldn't get off the plane. I've been treated like, uh, even not animal, like uh, luggages or not human being. This passenger says as the debacle unfolded, she saw members of the flight crew outside the plane taking selfies. We are very aware of the difficult situation that has been experienced by our passengers. We have made our apologies for that and we apologize again. Air Transat will present its side of the story tomorrow, and the transport minister says he'll be watching. 
Earlier this year, Mark Garneau introduced legislation to address these kinds of issues. I think it's in all our, our interest to, uh, to pass this bill as quickly as possible so that in 2018 we can have a passenger bill of rights. Air Transit has tried to blame the Ottawa airport, questioning the experience of staff and whether it could handle an influx of diverted planes. Allegations the airport says have nothing to do with the situation. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Three Calgary police have been charged with assault and kidnapping, allegations which stem from a 2010 investigation involving at-risk youth. The officers were members of the vice unit, and it's alleged that they picked up a man they thought had some information. Then they drove him around for 20 minutes while assaulting him. The officers have been placed on administrative leave. Struggling youth are the focus of our next story as well. New research presents some hard data when it comes to mental health services. Young Canadians in particular are getting too little too late with some dire consequences. Vicka Dopia has the details. When she was just 12, Kimberly Rutledge struggled with something that just wasn't talked about. I didn't understand what I was going through. I didn't know what mental illness was. I didn't know how or when I needed to access help. What began as an eating disorder took control of her life. Treatment finally came, but it wasn't with her regular doctor. So I had to go to a walk-in, and I was diagnosed and given medication within 15 minutes of meeting this doctor. It's the most common way young people in Canada first access mental health treatment, according to new numbers based on actual patient data. Alberta leads the way with about half of 10 to 14 year olds going to emergency. For 20 to 24 year olds, Ontario had the lowest rate of follow up with a doctor within a week. No one province performed universally badly or universally well. Mm -hmm. The study's co-author says the numbers verify that everywhere, treatment for mental illness and addiction lags behind other essential health services, such as cardiovascular or cancer care, but it's no less critical. If your issues are detected early, and you have access to high quality care uh, early in the onset of your illness, it literally changes the trajectory of the illness and changes the trajectory of your life. In some provinces, help comes too late. People in their 20s in Ontario were much more likely to die from addictions or mental illness, and Manitoba's rate of suicide attempts for older teens is almost double that of other provinces. We see a lot of people who are struggling, and especially young people. This Manitoba emergency psychiatrist says the report raises critical questions about access to urgent mental health care. Another factor is that Manitoba has most of its care resources centralized in Winnipeg, and we know that people in the northern part of our province really do not do as well. The five provinces covered account for almost 90% of Canada's population. Still, the authors are hopeful others join in in the future to more accurately reflect the actual state of mental health care in Canada and find ways to improve it. Vicadopia, CBC News, Toronto. And at the other end of life, a new report says a growing number of caregivers are feeling distressed and angry from the load of caring for aging family members. One of the trends spotted in research by British Columbia's seniors advocate, Briar Stewart, has those details. Hi, Tali Fuxa. For the past seven years, Pauline Wong has been taking care of her mother and watching as she gradually deteriorates with dementia. Emotionally, um, you do it because you have to, you don't have a choice. Wong is one of roughly one million unpaid caregivers in British Columbia, and like her, many feel overwhelmed. That's the finding of a new report by the province's seniors advocate. She found that 31% of caregivers are in distress, with feelings of anger and depression. That's a 7% increase from two years ago. And Isabel McKenzie says the increase comes as families have less access to support. Despite our desire to have policies that encourage people to stay at home, the data indicate uh, that we are not putting our money where our mouth is. BC has one of the highest rates of distressed caregivers in the country. Good afternoon, family caregivers. And when caregivers become yeah. overwhelmed, this is often where they reach out. This non-profit organization says it receives a lot of what they refer to as tipping point calls. When they call us, where they are in the middle of a crisis. So, so it requires a bit of time to help them think it through. Yeah. 
Okay. So I love. Wong considers herself fortunate. Her family helps out and her mother spends four days a week at a drop-in centre. Two days are paid for by the government and two days she pays for. I don't know how people who don't have family help can do it or, or people who are working full time. BC's new government admits the system is stressed. Officials say they will act on the report's recommendations, which include strengthening the support available to caregivers. But with an aging population, it's clear that more people will find themselves in this very difficult role. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Straight ahead, Quebec City Muslims feel targeted again after the latest in a string of crimes. And to whittle down that big bank of points, expect more expensive and exotic rewards, like maybe half a million aeroplan points for tickets to the Stanley Cup Finals next year. Or U.S. Airways says 10 million miles may get you to the moon someday. Later, she told me haltingly, her two sons, Stanley and Parapam, were killed. Three, four years. Yes. No, three years, two years. Trois ans, deux ans. Mm -hmm. They were two and three years old. Just imagine a thousand boats of all shapes and sizes. Many have never navigated the Thames ever before. They'll be bunched up according to size with the hope that if one does nudge against another, a large vessel will capsize a smaller one. Wow. This is the cockpit of the plane. European monitors claim today that some of the large pieces of wreckage like this one have been cut into with a power saw. This is the flashpoint right here. The potential for the partition. Watch it. Right here, look at the crowd move. Several times in the five days we were in Crimea, our cameraman was attacked, pushed, pushed away. Eventually, we felt unsafe to go into those crowded areas, for example, around the parliament. It was a nice idea once. Back in 2008, the first couple locked up their love on the bridge and then tossed their key into the Seine as a sign of their undying devotion. You'd think it was a French thing, but no, the idea came from Serbia. Once Paris got a hold of it, there was no stopping it. If there were any question about Russia's sustained role in Syria, here's one answer. A Russian symphony, secured and protected largely by the Russian military, in a place revered by Syrians. Susan Ormson, CBC News, Palmyra, Syria. Wow. Quite a few experiences there over the years. And coming up in the next commercial break, I'll be taking your questions live. What's it like covering a war zone, a disaster, or reporting on the Queen? Leave a question in our comments and we'll try to get to all of them. Looking forward to it. No one did it like her. Live a glamorous life shadowed in misery. Throw light on worthy causes and change the British monarchy forever. It's no wonder that Diana still holds her magic 20 years after her tragic death. And to mark that grim anniversary tomorrow, Princesses, Princes William and Harry paid a quiet visit today to a garden dedicated to their mother at Kensington Palace. Nala Ayed has that story. The awkwardness of publicly marking the anniversary of your greatest loss. But such is the expectation, 20 years after celebrity ultimately claimed Diana's life. Her sons used the eve of to echo that painful memory and in the lead up to speak openly about their youthful grief. When you're that young and something like that happens to you, I think it's lodged in your heart and your head and it stays there for a very, very long time. At that point, I was still, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't there. I was, I was still in shock. Of course, little could be quite as awkward as teenagers made to walk behind their mother's coffin, trying to keep emotions in check before the eyes of millions. I think that was the hardest thing, is that, is that walk. It's a very long, lonely walk. But again, the, the, the sort of the balance between 
me being Prince William and having to do my bit um, versus the private William who just wanted to go into room and cry that he'd lost his mother. Also awkward for the princes then was the outpouring of emotion. I was like, well, you don't even, you didn't even know her. Why, why and how are you so upset? <laughs> but now looking back you know, over the last few years, I, you know, I've learned to understand um, there weren't many other public figures doing what she did. And so she was this ray of light in, in a fairly gray world. What is it beyond the celebrity, the whole Diana drama that keeps her top of mind for the rest even now? There's that signature public show of empathy, often since emulated and still appreciated in a routinely indifferent world. She was a first in many ways, uh, sort of things, and uh, um, she touched so many people. Diana was a very important person. She gave um, the royal family a human face. It's relating to ordinary people on the street. And you can see that in the work that both William and, and Harry do. She, they are her living legacy. Now in an era of social media and mass vigils, she also endures unmistakably in how the public grieves. I think that Diana's death marked a sea change in British society. We went changed from being the stiff upper lip society to being a trembling lower lip one, uh, where people were not afraid to emote and to cry in public, where people didn't hide their feelings. Like her own awkward confessions to fragility, her short life revealed a people's princess deeply flawed and human, still tragically fascinating and hard to forget. Nala Ayed, CBC News, London. A few notes on North Korea now in the wake of its missile launch over Japan. There was an emergency drill today that seemed just a bit too real. That's the sound no one wants to hear, a missile drill. In the Japanese port town of Wajima, school kids took it seriously, crouching under their desks like clockwork. The drill was pre-planned, but in the words of one resident, it felt more personal today. Yesterday, North Korea's missile flew over the area before breaking up in the sea north of Japan. The U.S. response to North Korea's launch seems less choreographed. Donald Trump today tweeted that talking is not the answer, but his defense secretary suggested otherwise. Are we out of diplomatic solutions for North Korea? No. We're never out of diplomatic solutions. We continue to work together. Today, the Russian foreign minister directly called his American counterpart to urge restraint. It is now time for concerted action. Today at the UN, in response to the missile launch, the US ambassador for disarmament called for more pressure on North Korea by having all states employ, quote, full enforcement of sanctions on that country. An arson investigation in Quebec City is opening up some deep questions about how safe Muslims are feeling there. That's because the man whose car was set on fire is the head of the mosque, where six men were shot dead in January, the same mosque that's been attacked repeatedly since last year. Alison Northcott has more. A charred vehicle burned in the middle of the night earlier this month. It belonged to Mohamed Labidi, a prominent figure at the Quebec City Mosque where six men were shot to death in January. It's the latest in what leaders at the Quebec Islamic Cultural Centre call a long series of hateful acts, and it's left some in the city's Muslim community feeling targeted. Well, maybe followed, maybe they try to have the information about us, where we are living or we are, what we are doing. I am really afraid, you know, and I'm not ready now to go to the mosque. Months before the shooting, a pig's head was left outside the mosque, and earlier this summer, a defaced Koran with a hateful note. A statement released today by the Islamic Cultural Centre says these are no longer mere demonstrations of extremists against immigration. The acts of these extremists are now infringing on our lives. This latest incident happened 36 hours after Quebec City's mayor announced a new cemetery for Muslims after a previous site was rejected by some local residents. 
some people are very uh, frustrated or are actually seeing the, the, Muslim, communi the Muslim community in Quebec City uh, as being too visible. And I think um, hateful incidents, hateful acts such as the one we, we have witnessed um, today uh, is an example of, of pe people being very intolerant. Today, Quebec City's mayor expressed his shock and disappointment. It doesn't look like Quebec City. I mean, we're not that cannot happen here so uh, so but I'm, I'm just saying that for the second time so I'm very worried we have to uh, condemn uh, and also be very careful not to legitimize or normalize the kind of the kind of far-right uh, xenophobic and often Islamophobic uh, rhetoric which we've heard in the public discourse uh, this is uh, this is not trivial Quebec City police say it's too early in their investigation to determine whether this latest act was a hate crime, but say they are treating this incident seriously. Allison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Just ahead, survival in Texas from a woman who knows all about disaster. Plus, uh, the grocery industry in Canada is ready for a change. In fact, we need a change. Once again, Amazon is poised to shake up how you shop. And the game of Chase the Ace with millions in the pot, well, tonight, at last, there is a winner. Here are the day's business numbers. The TSX went up 50 points. The dollar was down more than half a cent in New York. The Dow gained 27 points, and the price of oil continued to slip down 48 cents a barrel. All right, uh, we're on Facebook Live tonight taking your questions. Uh, any question, uh, fire away. I'm ready to answer them. Just have to put on my specs like I do every night at this time to see your questions which come in on my phone. Um, we got one earlier. Uh, Daniel Tammer asked, could you recommend a novel? You know, I love reading and I read too much nonfiction and facts and newspapers and not enough novels. Uh, and when I do, I just love it. Uh, Gift of Rain is one I like about a, Jap uh, a Malay British boy at the outbreak of World War II and his Japanese sensei. Another one, All the Light You Cannot See, about a blind girl and a, uh, in France and a German boy, again, at the um, outbreak of World War II. Just those two came to mind. Not that I read a lot of World War II novels, but they're fantastic books. Um, what was your favorite country you visited, reported from? Scott White is asking that. There are so many different... Um, stories that I've been involved with, it's almost 30 countries now, but I'll say the first one uh, that really came to mind was Nelson Mandela's election in South Africa in 1994. It was an amazing story. The whole world was watching and there was such promise and optimism at that time. It left an indelible um, impression on me. Uh, uh, Daniel Tammer, oh, I like your fashion. Is there someone else behind what you decide to wear to work? No, it's whatever I can grab out of the closet, honestly, and put, put stuff together. I'm not kidding. It's quite haphazard. Uh, Jacqueline Gauthier, do you feel that it's more difficult for you as a female journalist? Sometimes it's quite um, an asset, like in uh, Afghanistan, in southern Afghanistan. It's very conservative, and I can go in and talk to women in their homes where a male reporter could not, because uh, in that part of the world, they're not allowed to be seen in the company of men other than their family. So it can sometimes be uh, a great asset. And I think we tell stories sometimes differently. It's good to have both. Uh, Jordan Smith, is there one story that you've covered that stayed with you over the years? I mentioned Mandela's election, the whole Afghan story when Canadian forces were in combat in southern Afghanistan, the series of stories that left uh, a big impression on me, a difficult task, still a really difficult place. Beautiful country, though, uh, amazing people, and um, Canada had such a footprint there. I don't think Canadians realize we were very well known in the southern part of Afghanistan for our work there. Um, David Greenwood, when you're covering a war zone as a journalist, how do you keep a dispassionate observer and don't help start helping evacuees or handing out blankets? That's an excellent question. There is a line with, we, we hope we don't cross, but you know, stories are about humanity. They're about empathy, they're about anger, they're about lying, they're about human emotion. 
So in some parts, like in the Haiti earthquake, where 250,000 people died, we did step up and help people connect to other people. I remember a story about a Canadian woman and her daughter who were living in Haiti and Port-au-Prince and their family was back in Montreal and we connected them together. We, we did that service. It was a story, but it was also what we were supposed to do. You can see that playing out in Texas too with many journalists coming upon people who need help. It's, it's, it's a fine line, but it can be crossed. Um, Charles Edmund, what do you consider the greatest challenge to truth and fact in this era of fake news? People accusing us of fake news. That's the greatest danger. Uh, I, I have said before, I, get, I bridle at the topic. Um, I've never been asked to do anything but facts and um, lots more on that. But I got to run back to the news tonight. When disaster strikes, it can be a moment of truth. People pushed past their limits and often discover what they're really capable of. And that's exactly what happened to Aisha Nelson when the brutal force of Harvey was unleashed on Houston. Here's her story, which ends with a twist. Friday was raining hard, and we thought that um, the, the rain was just gonna, it was gonna rain and flood a little bit and we could stay inside. Cause I had prepared myself. I had bought water, food and stuff for my family. So we can stay in and um, like any other storm, maybe I, I knew we would lose life, but I didn't know that we was going to get all that water. So Friday, it was raining hard, but it didn't flood. So it was like, it's going to be okay. And they told us we didn't have to evacuate. So then um, on Saturday, it had stopped raining and they had the football game on, the pre-football football game and a fight on it. It was at my sister's house. And so me and my family, we drove over to my sister's house to watch the fight. But we, I left my mother-in-law behind. I kept calling and checking on my mother-in-law. And when I went to go check on my mother-in-law, she called me up and said, the water is coming in. And my mama stays in the same apartment complex as me. So I called my mama up and I told her, could she go get her? Cause she is um, disabled and she can barely walk. Both of them are um, elderly, but my mama is a strong woman. So she went and got her out the house and she called me and said, my house was gone. So once I found out my house was gone, I, I, we stayed at my sister's house and it started raining and water started coming in. We tried to leave, but they had walked so much water, we couldn't drive out and we couldn't walk out. Of so my, my, my son's friend's mother told us we can stay in her apartment, which is across the street from my sister. And those apartments are built like on, a, they got an upside and a downside. My sister stayed on the downside. So by my sister staying on the downside, we had to go to the higher level. So she told us we can stay on the second floor, but they had never been through a storm. And I was telling them, I was like, this storm seems it's gonna be bad and we're gonna have to try to get up out of here. And then later on that night, the water started coming up and then that's when the neighbors came in and was like, uh, can we come over here with y'all? We don't wanna die. And I was like, come on. And it was like five different families and we all bundled on the second floor of the apartment. And they had a little small picture window and in that small picture window, I had um, I had to take a, um, a weight, a dumbbell weight, and bust the window and take some wire cutters to take the hinges off the window because some other men were kind of big and and I wanted to make sure they could get out. So we tried the big people first, and once we found out that the big per people could get out, we did the children and, and I put a chair at the um, on the outside and the inside so they can step up so nobody won't hurt themselves. And so we went on the roof while it was raining and stuff and um, waited for um, somebody to rescue us. And it took them to get to us like seven hours. But in the meantime, we seen dead bodies. My children witnessed dead bodies floating across the water in front of our face. People inside their cars blowing their horn, asking for help. I wouldn't wish this on nobody. The difference between these two storms is Katrina water rose fast and it was calm. This storm was a storm where the water came up a little, it was coming, it started coming, it was started off slow, then it came fast and it was like a water rafter. Like the, the current was so fast, nobody human could swim in that water. I don't even think the Coast Guards could swim in that water. I 
I don't have no words. I, 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 right now, I, I'm just really, I'm trying to take it one day at a time because it, it is really hard starting over, especially not knowing what's next. And I'm in a convention center, as you can see behind me, laying on a cot when I, I wish I was in a, a nice warm bed with a hot meal with my babies and my, my husband and my family. I want to bring awareness to anybody that, that's out there that's, that's going through something. If I could get through two storms, you can get through anything. Wow, what a story. Stay with us. We are going on a shopping trip next because Canada's grocery business is in for a revolution. The television show that challenges all comers is still doing just that. 30 years on. Front Page Challenge is entering its 30th year of broadcasting in Canada. And last night at a glittering reception in Ottawa, they remembered and they celebrated those memorable years. Dan Bjarnason has prepared this report. Few Canadian institutions have lasted as long as Front Page Challenge. And to become more popular year after year is something to be envied. That's the opinion of one viewer at least, expressed over a decade ago, and now, after 30 years on the air, the show's more of an institution than ever. Tonight on Front Page Challenge. Hammered out in 1957 in a producer's living room as a summer fill-in, and in a business where programs fight for breath and often die after a few weeks, Front Page Challenge is one of the most successful TV shows in history. The program developed the look of a miniature history of the 20th century. There was the silly... No, 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 let's not talk about diamonds. Uh, that's a dull <laughs> Let's subject. not talk about diamonds. Let's, let me talk to you about your ex-husband, George Sanders. Are you still friends with him? <laughs> Every time you speak let's about him... Let's talk you're... about diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> there was the profound... Uh, my whole Christian background had a great deal to do with my... Uh, coming to this conclusion that love and nonviolence should be the regulating ideals in any struggle for human dignity. Perhaps the show's chief drawing card was, until his death, an endearing scamp, Gordon Sinclair. Did the personal event happening to you cause you to feel happy or joy or euphor euphoric? Oop. No euphoric. <laughs> there wasn't an ounce of euphoric in it. <laughs> On occasion, the panel goofed on the obvious. Well, let's see what's left. Uh, Mumbly peg, I guess that they don't do that anymore. Uh, this, uh, this is a sport for you to play a run around. Is, is it boxing by this chance? No. <laughs> no. Swimming, swimming, swimming. <laughs> Not once in four appearances did they manage to guess. Gordy Hawk! Hooray! <laughs> One of the original moderators 30 years ago, Alec Barris today is the program's writer. He recalls some early disasters, such as Winston Churchill's son, Randolph. Who was sort of nine sheets in the wind by the time he got to the studio. Went to the wrong studio first, and uh, when he finally got to the right studio, he insisted that somebody go out and get him a bottle of whiskey, which he killed before the show, and he didn't even need it. Then there was the defecting Russian diplomat, Igor Gazenko. And then when he came in, he insisted that he, A, he had to have his voice muffled so it wouldn't be recognizable. B, he had to wear the hood over his face so he wouldn't be recognized. But the funny part came in when he saw that Fred Davis was in the makeup room getting makeup on. He insisted he had to have makeup on too, even though he was going to wear the hood. It's hard to imagine now, but the critics panned the show opening night 30 years ago. A corpse, they called it. A long 30 minutes. The critics were wrong. Last night, the taping of a one-hour birthday spectacular. Critics had also predicted that Front Page Challenge wouldn't last after Gordon Sinclair. The critics were wrong again. Dan B. Arneson, CBC News, Ottawa. And they called my dad the King of Griffintown. When I was a kid, there was a war going on. Bikers and the mob, and gangs. And it was bad. You're nothing like him. What are you doing here, man? Just reminding me who you are. Come on! Come on! Come on! I love you, man. I love you too. Johnny's back.
Outstanding, Tuesdays at 8 on CBC. Summer is golden. The CBC Sports app. 500 plus hours of live competition. Download the CBC Sports app. Amazon grabbed consumers' attention this week when it made some deep price cuts at Whole Foods after its takeover. But there's a much bigger plan at play than simple discounts. As the CBC's Jacqueline Hansen tells us, Amazon is trying to change the way you do your grocery shopping. Most of the shoppers at this grocery store are buying food the same way they always have, in person. But one man on a mission is shopping for someone else. He picks, pays, Thank you, your service packs, and delivers whatever customers order through the Instabuggy app. The service is the creation of entrepreneur Julian Glazer. It makes sense, you know, for, for customers to place their orders from their couch or from their office as opposed to having to go to the store and spend that time and carry stuff. Imagine getting all the groceries you need. Amazon sees that very same potential demand. It already operates Amazon Fresh Grocery Delivery in about two dozen cities in the U.S., Europe and Japan, but its takeover of Whole Foods this week is being seen as a way to ramp that up. So they're looking at increasing volume essentially, and that's Amazon's playbook. And further disrupt how consumers shop from in-person to online. They've done it before, first with books, then expanding to offer almost any other item consumers could want when they want it. They're trying to build that bridge between the two worlds and Amazon is well positioned to do that because it is able to understand consumers better than consumers themselves. Even if it takes Amazon time to expand its grocery delivery to Canada, this analyst says the threat it poses will push Canadian grocers to innovate. Just because this is happening between Amazon and Whole Foods, the Loblaws, the Metros, the Sobeys, they're all going to have to respond. Some have already tried introducing online ordering for pickup. We deliver fresh and pre- While others are teaming up with ready-to-cook meal delivery services. And one Toronto area grocer even bought and now operates its own delivery service. Good morning. Hi. Grocery Gateway. Thanks. Would you like them in the front of the house or in the kitchen? But grocers will likely feel pressure to do even more and compete on prices. Some analysts say Amazon isn't getting into groceries for the money, but instead they want consumers to buy even further into Amazon's entire ecosystem and trade their physical shopping cart for a virtual one for everything. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. As Jacqueline mentioned, of course, prices do matter, especially when you consider how much we all spend on food. According to Statistics Canada in 2015, the average Canadian household spent $6,126 on groceries, and that breaks down to $510 a month or $117 a week. Those numbers did not include restaurant visits, which added another $2,500 to the year's food bill. Coming up, a couple million can buy a lot of groceries. The jackpot is claimed in an epic game of Chase the Ace. It was middle-class Canada on wheels, a convoy of buses carrying hundreds of homeowners protesting against Canada's soaring interest rates. Most of the protesters face crushing mortgages of more than 20%. Some face losing their homes altogether. All of them are angry. I'm angry and I'm helpless. I just feel helpless. I mean, what are we going to do? I'm just sick and tired of this kind of a government. Vince and Linda White are typical. This month, their mortgage payments go from $650 to more than $1,000. I think there's something has to be done about it. I think it's ridiculous. I mean, too many people are losing their homes. As the so-called convoy of anger rolled on towards Ottawa, federal Liberal MPs were meeting in special caucus. Like the protesters, their message was the federal government must do something for homeowners. When the buses arrived on Parliament Hill, they were met by opposition politicians, but there was no one there from the Trudeau government. We want to help! We want to help! We want to help! 
The demonstrators went ahead and told their stories anyway. I'm sick of an economic policy that tells me that after five years of blood and sweat and tears that I can't have my home anymore? I want to know why. Why can't I have my home? Later, a small group was allowed to meet Housing Minister Paul Cosgrove. All we are getting from you people are shrugs. Well, tighten your belts, but we've done it as tight as we can do it. We're the people you're working for. We put you in office, and believe me, we can take you out. We don't want promises. We want people who are out of their homes now to have action now, not after the budget, not after promises, but now. False prophets. I don't know what the particular response will be, but I'll tell you that the government will meet its commitment in the speech from the throne when we started out as a liberal government last year that we will not stand by and see large-scale foreclosure of people's homes in this country. As the Liberal caucus broke up, MPs emerged smiling. They'd been told help was coming for homeowners. And Cosgrove announced that he'll ask Canadian banks and trust companies to stop foreclosing on Canadians, at least until after next month's budget. I know that the, uh, the, the, the companies have said that they'll look to all devices that they can to assist people to maintain home ownership. Prime Minister Trudeau left the caucus meeting apparently confident that he'd cooled out his angry backbenchers. The angry homeowners will have to await the outcome of a special two-day cabinet meeting which begins tomorrow and the resumption of Parliament next month before they learn the extent of government plans to deal with the interest rates crunch. And they called my dad the King of Griffin Town. When I was a kid, there was a war going on. Bikers and the mob, and gangs, and it was bad. You're nothing like him. How are you doing here, man? Just reminding you who you are. Come on! Come on! I love you, man. I love you too. It's been a long road to this moment, a path paved with soaring hopes dashed. But tonight, in St. John's, Chase the Ace came to its multi-million dollar conclusion. It's a church lottery, and the ticket holders, lucky enough to win a raffle, drew a card from an ever-dwindling deck, hoping for that elusive Ace of Spades. After 45 draws, here's what happened, as witnessed by the CBC's Peter Cohen. It's a church fundraiser that's brought out more people than a visit from the Queen, Pope, or even a rock star could. Organizers were planning for 100,000 people. That's one in five people in Newfoundland and Labrador crammed into the Goulds neighborhood of St. John's, each person hoping to become a millionaire. The first card of the night flipped over didn't reveal the ace, so another ticket and another chance. It was Don and Mark Gorman's turn next. With this ace of spades, they're taking home $2.6 million of prize split with three couples, but it's still enough to change their life. I'm now going to retire. <laughs> the event has become about more than just the money. You know, we're going to miss it all. I mean, we get together in the mornings, we get together in the evenings, and it's just like this big old garden party, right? Now it's like, what are we going to do on Wednesday? <laughs> It all started 44 weeks ago as just a small fundraiser for the St. Kevin's Parish Church. At first, the jackpots were just a few thousand dollars. Each week, tickets were sold, a name was drawn, and a card from the deck was flipped over. No one uncovered that ace of spades, so no one got the grand prize. It all just rolled over week after week. For this final draw, the lineup stretched for kilometers. Many people waited in line for five hours just to buy tickets. It's not just the church that's profited. Buskers had a captive audience to make a few dollars. Kids and charity groups sold parking spaces, bottles of water and food. At the local diner, they couldn't keep up with all the orders on Wednesdays, but not everyone in the neighborhood was happy to see the place shut down once a week, clogged with cars and people. Revenue on Wednesday is zilch, nothing. I just can't get anything done. 
With the school year starting soon and millions in the bank, organizers decided this would be a mega draw. One way or another, the jackpot would be given out. Kind of disappointed that it's all going to be over because it's been such a, a big part of all the community's lives now since October. The other big winner has been the church, bringing in millions from the lottery. It has rather modest plans for its winnings, fix up the steeple, expand the cemetery and redo the front steps. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. That is the national for tonight. Thanks for joining us. For your news at any hour, go to cbcnews.ca. I'm Susan Ormiston, and I'll see you here tomorrow night.